Good evening, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the Feminist Futures Institute. My name is Tamika Middleton. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am here from Atlanta, Georgia, and I am the Deputy Director at Women's March. So I'm so excited to be here with all of you this evening. So excited that so many of you have joined us for this first in this amazing series. This is the first of eight web episodes. And so we hope that you can join us for the entirety of the next eight weeks. From the assault on women's freedoms in Afghanistan to the recent devastating ban on abortions in Texas, from the rise of right-wing insurgencies to the catastrophic impacts of climate change, it has never been more clear that women are under attack. So over the next eight weeks, we'll be here together exploring how did we get here? And also where do we go from here? We'll listen to and we'll learn from and learn about everyday women across history who have navigated these waters before and will radically envision where we go from here. So today in this very first session called Feminism in Practice, we'll be led and anchored by the amazing, phenomenal Barbara Smith and Issa Noyola. Barbara Smith is uh, a one of our strategic advisors at Women's March and Issa Noyola is on the board at Women's March. And so we're always amazed and honored to be in their presence. Uh, and so we're so glad that you all get to experience them in the way that we do. So stay tuned and we will start shortly. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Isa. Uh, it's such an honor to share space with you. Um, you know, thank you to Women's March for bringing us together. Uh, I know sometimes our schedules uh, can be kind of hectic. Uh, we have our hands in a lot of different conversations and organizing and strategizing and uh, I'm just honored to have this time together to share some of our work and yeah, just what we've been cooking. I feel the same way, Isa. Um, again, I'm Isa Noyola. I use she, her pronouns. And I am the co-chair of the Women's March Board. I'm also the deputy director at Mi Gente, which is a national Latinx political hub for our communities across the country. Um, and I am super excited to be here to share some of the work uh, we've been moving as trans immigrant communities um, in the fight for liberation, in the fight for our humanity. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to kick it over to, to Barbara to introduce herself. Thank you so much. And welcome to everyone who's here with us from all over the country. Um, my name is Barbara Smith. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm speaking to you from Albany, New York, which is Mohican uh, and uh, Mohawk land, also uh, part of the, the Haudenosaunee uh, Nation, which is sometimes referred to as the Iroquois Nation by, I understand, by white people. Uh, but the Haudenosaunee um, are the people who had a functioning democracy long before the invaders and settlers uh, came. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Iroquois Confederacy. So we honor the land uh, that we are uh, here as guests on. Um, and I'm theoretically retired. Uh, you would never know it. <laughs> uh, what, what did I do before I retired? What am I doing now? Um, yeah, I'm probably, you know, people probably, probably know me as a black feminist activist out lesbian since the 1970s, uh, when it was no joke to be out in whatever way. And, uh, you know, I've written things. I was a co-founder of the Combahee River Collective, which I'll be hoping to say a few words about uh, as we tell our stories and share our stories uh, this evening. But I think uh, what I would say, and so honored to be a part of the Women's March uh, community as a senior advisor, um, but what I would say is that what we're about, and I know Issa shares is we're about justice. We're about uh, liberation and freedom. That's what we're really involved in. So whatever the activities we're involved in, 
at the present time or in the past or recent past, it's all toward those ends of liberation exactly. and freedom. So I think that's what we're about. And also, Issa and I had never uh, met each other until oh. we started preparing uh, for this. And we're supposed to be acting like we were on some back porch <laughs> <that's completely laughs> together. <laughs> and we are, we are uh, actually, uh, we don't have to act, you know, because I think we have great, you know, uh, synergy and affection uh, already uh, with each other. But uh, this is how new friends, uh, new, sus new sisters in struggle, kind of try to communicate uh, with uh, our nation, uh, our women's uh, march and women's movement nation. So I'm going to uh, say a few words. We're uh, sharing stories this evening. And uh, we were asked to pick two, you know, think of two. Of course, I thought of three. And the first uh, story I wanted to share is about um, the Gremke sisters of South Carolina. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of talk these days about white feminism, a lot of talk about, uh, well, white supremacy and racism and how it plays itself out in the country and the, the uh, society as a whole and also how it plays itself out in our movements. And what I often talk about is that people don't necessarily know that there is a tradition of anti-racist feminism. This comes as news to many because we live in such a toxic racial environment. It's hard to imagine that there were people who committed themselves for centuries, centuries ago to that project of eradicating white supremacy and uh, you know, uh, racism, racial capitalism, et cetera. So the Gremke sisters, uh, Sarah Moore Gremke and Angelina Emily Gremke, they were among the two, but they were also like just far out front leaders. Um, Sarah, who was older, she was born in 1792. Yes, 1792 and died in 1873. Angelina, was born in 1805 and died in 1879. So just think about the fact that there are people who we can accurately describe, describe as anti-racist feminists who were born, one of them was born in the 18th century. So why do we know that history? You know, why don't we know their stories? They came from a very rich, wealthy family that owned other humans, enslaved people, uh, in uh, South Carolina. Their father was a judge. I think he was on the Supreme Court of the state of South Carolina. He was a staunch supporter of slavery and also uh, opposed any rights for women. Sarah, who was brilliant from all that we can determine, I think Angelina was too, but Sarah uh, was really interested in studying law. She would have loved to have studied law, but of course, because she was a woman at the time, her brother got to go to Yale and she got to stay home and um, just read all the books that were in the family's library and not be able to mobilize that. They wrote, they spoke, they spoke out against um, slavery because they had experienced it firsthand. And they were really, really uh, disgusted by what everybody else around them took as being, uh, being, being for granted. Uh, they didn't take things for granted. They went against the grain. And uh, they eventually moved north to Philadelphia, more hospitable for the abolitionist movement, the first abolitionist movement. And the two abolitionist movements, you know, the one from the early uh, 19th century and the one that we have now in the first decade, decades of the 21st century, they have a lot in common because both of those movements are about um, racial, uh, racial uh, oppression and doing something about it. Um, the abolitionist movement now, of course, focuses on the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration, but there's some definite you know, connections between those abolitionist movements. Um, I'm not gonna say too much more about them for now, but now you have a, like a kind of a marker and uh, like ho hopefully a teaser that you're going to find out more about them, uh, the, uh, the Grem K sisters, and I'll say more about them as we uh, talk, but I think Isa, I'd love to hear. Um, no, I mean, I was just gonna say I I'm glad you're starting with this story and like lifting up these, you know, anti-racist uh, 
folks and examples, right? That, cause I think so much of the conversation right now is about defining what feminism is um, and about how we show up. And I think sometimes the brand of feminism today is, has been co-opted for sure. Um, and so we have plenty of examples of what not to do and that, and, and examples that fall short, right? Like I think of so many political actors who uh, think feminism is just about inclusion, right? Or, and, and anti, being an anti-racist is about inclusion and diversity and, and championing those things while at the same time, um, you know, working towards, uh, you know, promoting and pushing sort of the demands of the state that are so often in conflict around criminalizing our communities. And so for you to start with this story, I think is just a perfect way. And thank you so much, Isa. And I think like uh, how I see the Gremke sisters connecting to what you're uh, wanting to share with us um, around uh, detention, around uh, attacks on uh, immigrants, around uh, trans uh, people being even more uh, uh, targeted by those incredibly violent and unjust state systems. Um, we're talking about people who don't agree with business as usual. And in your work, you do not agree with business as usual. You are questioning at every turn. And I'd love for you to share some of those questions and some of those observations you have about like, who's in ICE now, who's an employee yeah. by ICE, and how that has helped us. Um, I think, well, thank you. I mean, I think so much of my work has been informed, you know, is on the shoulders of ancestors and of, you know, just folks who really pushed the line, um, you know, and the work that you've laid out for so many of us to follow, right, with the work and the statements and the political line that you've really, in just with so much care and so much generosity have shared with us over the years that I think for me, I have, you know, picked up on that thread and and it's been important to uh really show up in with integrity for all the sacrifices that have been uh, made over the years of uh black feminists and queer and trans folks who put everything on the line and i think for me to um champion the campaign work to end trans detention to um in the fight for immigrant justice and the fight for trans liberation um, it is not simply around, um, you know, creating a, creating a society that just tolerates us and that just sees us through a lens of policies and reforms, but more of um, our, our full selves, how we show up in this world in complex ways. And I think um, so much of the work that we are doing to end trans detention is really pushing that context, um, especially in in the work around, uh, you know, why the U.S. government continues to punish and torture um, asylees and survivors of violence, survivors of sexual violence, folks who are traveling um, with so much to, you know, they've suffered so much injustice already and the push factors of why they're leaving their home country, why they're leaving their families, why they're leaving their neighborhoods um, and culture. Right. And so to be met at the border with only more violence and, um, you know, just uh, an overall feeling of disdain and uh, unwelcoming, uh, you know, rhetoric from our government is to me, I, as a society, it reflects so much that we've tolerated that, that we continue to allow that, that we continue to see the degradation of humanity at the border and inside detention. Um, and I think so much of this administration you know, I think we went out all hard during Trump, but so much of this administration is getting away with so much, um, you know, continued attacks on, you know, you see, and, and the perfect, and the examples that I, are shown and demonstrated so drastically are with immigrants, um, are with trans communities. And I think we see whether it's from the federal government or state or state governments or local governments that we see the promulgation and the growth of detention. We see anti-trans, anti-queer and LGBT rights um, being questioned and introduced to um, 
you know, really put into question our, our humanity, you know, and it's not the bills that are being introduced right now are not simply around public accommodations or bathroom use. It is really to put into question how our lives fit into the larger uh, society. And I think um, at least my work and so many folks that have, have been targets of state violence continue to push the line of what's, impo what's um, possible um, and how do we build power with communities that are under surveillance, that are over-criminalized, over-policed, um, and under-resourced? That, that is a t terrific, a terrific uh, like exposure introduction for people who may not have these issues around immigration and refugees and uh, the incarceration system that is a part of the uh, punitive immigration uh, operation, operation uh, are the immigration structures in our society. Like why do people who are fleeing, as you said, uh, the worst, most atrocious violence, why are they treated as if they're criminals? It doesn't make any sense. And uh, also there's a factor of like, how did their countries that they're fleeing get to be in such bad shape? Uh, could it have anything to do with the initials USA? Possibly. Could that possibly have anything to do with it? Because our uh, nation is in the habit of destabilizing exactly. other nations, their, uh, their uh, governmental systems, their economic systems for self-gain. Uh, self you know, so if you see some oil somewhere, some bananas somewhere, or some land somewhere, whatever it is you see, you think, oh, I'd like that. I think I think I need to have that for myself. So like, let's just get rid of these other people. I mean, there are places that don't even create and grow enough crops now in the countries that people are fleeing to feed the populations of the countries where they are. Exactly. I mean, they, they have taken away all the sustenance crops so they can grow the one thing that they want to see coming out of there, whatever right. that might be, chocolate, coffee, who knows? But the thing is that um, we have problems. We have some serious problems and they do go back, you know, to before, to before the Grim case sisters, because of course, this is a settler col colonial nation. What kinds of immigration policies would you expect from a country that's well, a settler? And what kind, and, and, you know, so much of it is are, you know, you know, right now in the national conversation, so much of it is focused on, you know, um, passing you know this budget and reconciliation package and mm -hmm. you know i think so much uh you know when you work at uh, companies or nonprofits you know a lot so an adage that is shared is like a budget is a reflection of values and i think the fact of the matter is that we've our values have you know have been prioritizing the military and you know as an example the Department of Homeland Security, just to give an example to folks to really kind of ground the magnitude of why we saw some, some of the, we continue to see the atrocities at the border um, with it, the most recent example of how Haitians were being attacked on horseback is that the Department of Homeland Security has been funneling billions of dollars, 300, about $333 billion on immigration enforcement. Right. And so when we think about reimagining, when we think about what is possible, when our resources are being sucked up into this enforcement mechanism and policies and structures, you know, it's no wonder why we continue to see these examples unfold in such extreme ways. Right. Why children have been in cages, why folks are being attacked in the most vulnerable spot, asylees, right, where we it's a legal sort of mechanism of how folks can enter this country, yet we've made it such high stakes. And so um, the, the violence that has been enacted has been so extreme. Right, indeed. And I think, you know, I'm trying to read the minds of the thousands of people who are on with us uh, this uh, for me evening, uh, but today. Uh, and I'm wondering if any of you all are thinking, I thought this was gonna be about feminist futures. I haven't heard them talk about feminism yet. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, we're concerned about, you know, uh, racism and white supremacy and like uh, attacks on immigrants and violence against uh, uh, trans people. Yeah. But where is the feminism? Hello. This is feminism. Exactly. This is, this is 21st century feminism. 
And it's also 20th century feminism because it's the kind of feminism that the Combahee River Collective mm -hmm. uh, was out strong for. You exactly. know, we were about if it's affecting women, if it's affecting people, if it's affecting the planet, you know, then we're about that. If it's if it's uh, an assault on uh, both humans and other living creatures, we're about that, you know, and so it's not, you know, it's not completely new. There's just one other thing, thing I wanted to share about the Grimm case sisters. They were uh, feminists in the sense that they were speaking out at a time that women were not allowed to. They paid major prices and got major sanctions because they would speak out publicly at a time that women were not supposed to ever speak anywhere where there was a mixed audience or in public. So they had been speaking in people's homes about how important it was to look at slavery and to end it. But when they started speaking out in public forums, oh, they took uh, much heat, much heat indeed. And uh, they simultaneously then were in support of ending uh, the system of chattel slavery, which is generally un understood by historians and others to be the worst system of slavery that ever occurred in human history. It cannot be compared to others because uh, unlike other systems of uh, slavery, like with the Romans, the Greeks, whomever, you could actually get out of those systems. You could even intermarry with the people who enslaved you because often slavery was a result of conquering in war and winning in a war. Whereas here in what became the United States, it was an unchangeable status passed on by the mother to all of her offspring, even if the fathers of those offspring were the white masters. And that's where we're living. And we're still living there. These are feminist issues. But one thing about the Grum case sisters is that, that I found interesting is that they did not just denounce slavery. They actually denounced racial prejudice. And they also argued that white women had a natural bond with black women who were enslaved. And they, these views, these were extreme ideas, even for radical abolitionists, because they were getting toward the idea of equality. Yeah. You know? uh, racism is wrong. Because, see, there are a lot of people who were against slavery and thought it should end, and they didn't think that uh, Black people were equal or human. <laughs> you know, they didn't yeah. think that we were inherently inferior. So the Grimm case sisters were stepping out, and they were saying, no, racial prejudice is wrong, and there should be understandable easy to see bonds between white women who are not enslaved by law, although living under patriarchy, and uh, black women who are chattel by law. So they were out there. Find right. out about the Grimm case. Well, and I think, again, that's uh, just a perfect example of just the kind of feminism that we're trying to share and connect is that, you know, as feminists, as folks that are really thinking about interlocking forms of oppression and dismantling that and really pushing the boundaries. I think as organizers, as activists, as folks that we are like, you know, going to the rallies, so much of what we're trying to do is really put um, like what what is at the heart of it is like what is possible, right? And I think that's what you have demonstrated in your leadership with the Kam Kambahi Collective, uh, and the statements that have come out of that have really, really pushed, right? That we have continued to um, imagine what liberation in our lifetime looks like, what how like Southerners on new ground always share sort of their, that, that framework, right? And I think to me, that is the exciting part of uh, how we're trying to really think of defining um, feminism of what is possible, what we continue to hold on to in terms of values and beliefs um, and what we like pushing the lines of what is acceptable because and so much of the pushback is a natural process It's a natural part of this work and of going out and putting it all on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about um, Lisa and I are talking about feminism for all of us. An operational practical feminism that has as much meaning 
and impact for now considered or described as essential workers, which we always just knew to be working poor women of color. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but now there's a name with the, the pandemic, you know, uh, essential workers who still don't have benefits and still get exploited and sexually harassed and uh, first fired, uh, you know, uh, last fired, first fired, the whole thing. We're talking about a feminism that works for the uh, the caregivers in our society, uh, just as it works for the people in the corporate uh, suites. And in fact, the feminism I've always wanted to build works better for the uh, for the majority of us than it does for those people who you know do performative stuff around women's rights or whatever. And and exactly. it does, yeah, as opposed and to like digging in. And we just have way too many examples of what not to do. I mean, I just I think about the meetings that I'm in sometimes with um, Immigration's Customs Enforcement or the Department of Homeland Security or even with the, the Biden administration. And, you know, we think that because we have women of color in leadership, we have women of color in those positions that they are going to champion feminist values. Um, and so much of it is erroneous and is misconstrued and just twisted. Um, how the state again co-ops feminism is so dangerous um, and why these conversations are are critical to push back against that notion of what fe the brand of feminism that the state continues to push forward. Right. And, and the thing is that to the degree that those who have official power do things and actions that benefit the majority of people is because of something called movements. Exactly. It's movements that exactly. put, uh, those people in power to change up and do something different. Um, I, I, I feel like there's been talk about LG, uh, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, recently, and how uh, he was, uh, he's generally considered to be the uh, president, the US president who did the most, has, uh, did the most in relationship to racial equality. And that's really interesting because of course, Lincoln is in that mix too. But Lincoln thought that uh, black people, once they were emancipated, needed to be shipped to uh, back to Africa. So that's where he was coming from. He changed ab about that, but his original idea was yes, free them and then get rid of them. <laughs> So, you know, like uh, Lincoln did not free uh, anyone who I uh, am aware of. Uh, but as I said, uh, with LBJ being held up as this icon of racial, uh, you know, like uh, racial equality and, and fighting racism. And yeah, major bills did pass, you know, the Civil Rights uh, Bill of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 did pass during his administrations. How and why did they pass? Because of something called the struggle. The civil rights movement. So with our situation today and people in power, the degree to which they will do things that are effective in relationship to the lives of ordinary everyday people is because of movements. People sitting up in those buildings, you know, those white marble buildings in Washington and elsewhere, they're not thinking about justice per se, you know. It's the people on the streets who make exactly the situation, you know, are, you know, like what we saw starting last year after the lynching of George Floyd. I mean, an unprecedented. Outcome. Right. And I don't know exactly what has uh, changed. They can't pass, you know, uh, the, uh, they can't pass uh, police reform and you know, a lot of things. They can't pass voting rights, you know, because there's some white senators who are really very, very in love with things and the status quo and things as they are. But the thing is, the fact that some of this stuff is on the table and being discussed, it's because of movements. I've always felt Exactly. That. And that, you know, the pushing and the resistance, it, does, it doesn't just happen at and in those points of intervention, whether it be a rally or an action, right? Like a lot of folks are going to go out this Saturday to march um, and rally for abortion justice. And that is that is a great moment to publicly display that. And what that, what like, there is a commitment in showing up in those rallies, right? To show up, like, what does it mean to like actually follow that thread after the rally? And how are you gonna continue to push the boundaries of what is possible in this moment? Not just in right. the conversation, not just 
with our neighbors, but actually to really think about what, you know, and not just about the policies, right, but like the full breadth of what we're asking for in terms of our humanity. And I think that to me is what's at stake because we will continue to see these attacks. We will continue to see copycat legislation that continues to multiply. The right is continuing to organize, right? And so I think for us, it is an important moment to get clear about our fears. It is an important moment to get clear about why those fear exists is because what the liberation that we're asking for, it demands it, right, to face our fears. And I think this is an important moment for all of us to really get grounded in those, in what has happened in the past and why I appreciate your leadership, you know, your source of inspiration for so many of us. Um, you've demonstrated that, right? And how folks today, as folks take action, right, whether it's this Saturday or the coming days and months ahead and years to come, that what the commitment that and the seed that has been put out there is so important to honor and understand. Uh, I, I so appreciate the really uh, generous things that you are saying and have said about uh, the work. And uh, I just feel fortunate to have been on earth at a time that that work could occur. You know, um, I feel like uh, in some ways, we are conduits for what, you know, needs to happen. And I can see that you're looking at pictures of my twin sister, Beverly, and me. <laughs> Speaking of Kambahi, when we were young. And guess what? We're going to be 75 this year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So that's 150 years of Smith's yes. Okay? Are you ready for that? 150 years. Yeah, 75 each. <laughs> so much power. <laughs> but in any event, um, I'll skip ahead to uh, Kambi here a little bit. And then I do want to talk about Elizabeth Batita Martinez, Martinez because we're talking about activism and standing fast. And uh, Elizabeth Batita Martinez is a great example of that. Kambi uh, arose, uh, you know, to give dates, 74, 1974 in Boston. Uh, we were a grassroots black uh, feminist organization, predominantly lesbian, but not entirely. And we were basically making it up from scratch. Um, the Third World Women's Alliance that grew out of SNP, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and, all, and the Black Left, they laid groundwork, but we were not necessarily fully aware of everything that they had done, uh, although we were aware of their newspaper, Triple Jeopardy. So it wasn't that we were totally unaware, but we were trying to carve it out. And as Demeter Frazier, who was the, uh, one of the co-authors, there are three co-authors of the Combahee River Collective Statement, and I'm gonna hold this book up, which is How We Get Free, uh, Black Feminism and the Combahee River Collective, which is edited by Kianga Yamato Taylor, who by the way, just got a MacArthur yesterday, as I understand it. Uh, she didn't get it for this, so. <laughs> <laughs> We can bet on that, but be that as it may, <laughs> be that as it, well, maybe she did, who knows, I don't know. But in any event, um, as Demita Frazier, one of the three co-authors of the Comedy River Collective with my sister Beverly Smith, and I, uh, she said, unforgettably, at one of our meetings at Comedy, this is not a mixed cake. We have got to make this up from scratch. And that's exactly what we were doing because it wasn't like we were seeing role models necessarily. And, and the thing that was unique, well, there are a couple of things that were unique about Kambahi. Well, we talked about interlocking oppressions. We talked about what became, like would, what would now be described as intersectional politics, looking at all the systems uh, and how they dovetail with each other and uh, kind of uh, bump up against each other and how you can't really solve one without looking at all the others. I mean, we could solve racism, but what about misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, et cetera? What about class you know, and economic exploitation? You solve racism, but you didn't solve the rest of it. So right. uh, that's what we were trying to do. We also coined the term identity politics, which has uh, really been distorted over the years. And I won't go too much more into that as somebody <laughs> asked me. We're going to then uh, take another hour. <laughs> yeah, somebody asked me during the the Q&A about, so what was identity politics? What did it mean? Especially but, around the distortions of it, right? Yes, so many distortions, both from the right and sadly from the left now as well. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, I was thinking about the left. I wasn't actually thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, people we're supposed to be like in sync with. Yeah, right. Uh, but the two unique, unique things about Kambahi were that we talked about sexuality um, and asserted that homophobia and attacks on lesbians and by extension, gay men. And to be very clear and honest, we didn't have anything. There's nothing in Kambahi about transgender identity or transphobia. And the reason is that those issues had not been developed by the transgender community to a point where anybody who was awake, which we thought we were awake, you know, they had not been developed to that point that even people who were very politically active and conscious would have been able to integrate them into a, politi a political statement like the Combahee River Collective Statement. I'm very uh, glad to say, though, that as years and decades have gone on, that those of us who share the politics that come out of Combahee, and there are like hundreds of thousands, if not more, not more. I mean, it's it's become like a global uh, you know, kind of a movement, but uh, by and large, we are very down with uh, trans rights, you know, and when I talk to my friends, like sometimes they're, they're people, because of course, I, you know, being uh, in my age group, there'll be people I haven't talked to for 10 or 15 years, but we knew each other 40 years ago, and we, uh, we're chatting with each other, so happy, and then we start talking about trans issues, and like, we're on the same page, it's like, wow, and we didn't even have a study group about it, you know, it's like, no, I mean, right is right and wrong is wrong. We know what justice looks like and we are trying to learn. We're, 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 you know, we're ignorant. You know, obviously we're ignorant if we're not a part of the community, but we're open and want to learn and also to embrace and include. Yeah, I mean, I, I shared the sentiments of when you were talking about what really kind of pushed you all to imagine this space and the statements that came out is, you know, like I have felt similarly, like, you know, so much of the work in building organization and um, campaign work around these issues, um, intersecting issues of gender identity and incarceration and um, immigration has been, has felt like we're riding the bike, we're building the bicycle as we ride it, right? <laughs> um, and that we have very few possibility models. And a lot of that is because of how the state has violently murdered so much of our community, right? When I think about Victoria Arellano, who was handcuffed inside detention, who was HIV positive, right? And this was a few years back. And most recently, Victoria Arellano um, and uh, Johanna Medina and Roxana Hernandez, you know, I think of all those folks um, and that, you know, there still hasn't, justice has not been uh, has not happened for these women who died inside detention who were HIV positive, right? Um, the, you know, the government has not been held accountable. ICE has not been held accountable. Um, and I, and so when I think about the leadership of trans women, in particular Black trans women and, and Latina and immigrant trans women, um, so much of our experience has been surrounded by violence and how, um, you know, so many folks that I came up with are no longer with me. Right, and that should be here to continue to push some of the analysis and political uh, work that we've started. Right, and that's to me that's what's at stake here. Right, these conversations have material consequences. Right, that and and physical consequences when we are not embodying our feminist values in the full full possibility and breath. Right. Well, as we used to say, the bottom line is death. Exactly. Yeah, you think you're playing around with uh, organizing or activism or whatever, just consider that your lack or a lack of intervention are the worst exactly. consequences of oppression. It's death. Exactly. And we've always known that. I do want to, uh, you know, tease, you know, uh, your interest in uh, Elizabeth Batita Martinez legendary activists. Her dates are 1925 to 2021. And uh, just to kind of wrap it up, you know, in relationship to what we're talking about, she is the author of a number of books, a uh, leader in the Chicana feminist movement in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, and the uh, left, etc. I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, like against militarism, an incredible career. Just look her up. But 
One of uh, her book, uh, the book that she authored is called uh, De Colores Means All of Us. And that kind of, I think, wraps up what we've tried to share with you, that mm -hmm. that perspective of being all embracing, you know, her speaking out about uh, queer baiting 40 years before anybody else was even mentioning it in the context of, uh, in the, context of uh, the uh, Chicana, Chicano movements. I can't say how much I have enjoyed this. And one day we will be on that back porch uh, together. We will. And, uh, you know, things will be different. <laughs> That is that is why we yes we're put we're pushing so much right and putting it all on the line and you're through your examples over the years and all that you've the body of work is just phenomenal and I again I'm truly so much gratitude Barbara for all that you've done and same to you uh, this is a match made in heaven here <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna have to bring us back <laughs> and, and speaking of which make sure you tune in for the next uh, session. And the, sure. the succeeding sessions. Thank you so much, Women's March. Thanks to everybody.